Este año nuestra agenda This year, our academic agenda has as preamble the, the two topics that are of paramount importance. One is uh, st economic stability, the development of institutions. This allows uh, to move forward in the country's productivity. To learn about this process, we would like to give the floor to Mr. Luis Fernando Mejia Alzate. Director of the National Planning Department. Uh, so we would like to give the floor to Mr. Mejia Alzate. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon to each and every one of you. It is a pleasure to be here. Special greetings to Mr. Jorge Humberto Botero, Executive President of ASECOLDA, Mr. Juan Enrique Bustamante, President of the Board of Directors of ASECOLDA, Sandra Solorzano, Vice President of the Board of Directors of ASECOLDA, to the former Minister of Finance, Alberto Carrasquilla, Professor and Friend. It's, a, it's great to see you here. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Compañías de seguros, a todos los invitados especiales, a todo el público en general, es un gran placer de nuevo estar acá. Justo antes de entrar estaba hablando con el doctor Jorge Humberto acerca de su intervención y lo que me dice es que un tema fundamental de su charla va a ser el tema de la productividad. Entonces, la idea de esta charla que quiero compartir con ustedes es pensar un poquito en una agenda de largo plazo de cómo la economía colombiana se puede ajustar a un choque muy importante que sufrió de términos de intercambio y cuál es la agenda que venimos trabajando ya desde hace dos, tres años o incluso tiempo atrás en algunas dimensiones para revigorizar el crecimiento de la economía colombiana fundamentado en un componente muy importante que es la productividad. Entonces, arranquemos. Primero, antes de entrar en materia, quiero contar un mensaje que creo que es fundamental y es ratificar una historia de una enorme resiliencia de la economía colombiana que se ha construido de décadas de historia económica moderna, que es una cosa realmente extraordinaria desde el punto de vista de la historia de América Latina. Esta primera gráfica muestra en eso, esa dimensión del crecimiento económico en los últimos 111 años, desde 1906, y lo realmente, digamos, eh, eh, destacable de esta gráfica es que solamente en tres años de esa, digamos, más de un siglo de historia económica, la economía colombiana ha tenido crecimientos negativos, solamente en tres ocasiones de 111 años de historia económica. Esto es relativamente atípico. Eh, un profesor muy famoso de la Universidad de Harvard, experto en temas de crecimiento, estuvo en Colombia hace unos dos años, explicando el tema de los desastres económicos, definidos como economías que crecían negativo menos 10 o para abajo, contracciones importantes de la actividad económica. Colombia era el único país de la muestra que tenía el profesor Barro de 45 países, incluyendo países desarrollados y países en vías de desarrollo, que no había presentado un fenómeno de esta naturaleza. Entonces, hay una resiliencia muy importante desde el punto de vista de crecimiento. Y eso, por supuesto, se ha venido reflejando de manera muy importante en una consolidación de la tasa de inversión. La tasa de inversión básicamente muestra cómo es, eh, cuánto de cada 100 pesos que produce un país, cuánto se está yendo a acumulación de eh, inversión, de capital físico. Y esa inversión es la garantía del crecimiento económico en el mediano y largo plazo. Colombia mucho tiempo, en la década de los 90, tuvo tasas de inversión inferiores al 15%, 12, 13%. Siempre nos pensábamos, nos preguntábamos cómo Colombia podría alcanzar tasas de inversión similares a las de los países asiáticos, que estaban en tasas del 30%. Bueno, Colombia tuvo una expansión muy importante de la tasa de inversión en lo corrido del siglo XXI. Tuvimos un pico de inversión de casi el 30% en el 2014 y hoy, a pesar del choque de nuevo que sufrimos, la tasa de inversión está en 27%. Luego, de nuevo, es una muestra pues, de la confianza y de la solidez de la economía eh, colombiana. Y esta solidez y esta confianza se fundamenta, yo diría, que en tres pilares esenciales. Y les voy a explicar muy rápido. El primero es el pilar monetario. El pilar monetario habla de una tasa de cambio flexible, un banco central independiente y con credibilidad, que ha generado una reducción muy importante de la tasa de inflación, 
Pero destaco, esta, esta gráfica arranca en el 55, Colombia, a diferencia de todos, yo diría, los países de América Latina, nunca tuvo en su historia moderna económica un episodio de hiperinflación. Los pesos que hoy tenemos en nuestros bolsillos son pesos que siguen siendo los mismos de principios del siglo XX. Eh, pero sí tuvo un problema de una inflación relativamente moderada, pero estable, que después eh, se pudo reducir de manera importante una vez el Banco Central adoptó una inflación objetiva, una meta de inflación del de siguiente año, que generó una caída muy importante de la tasa de inflación. Fíjense, acá tengo el choque reciente de la inflación debido a una importante devaluación de la tasa de cambio, es el ajuste natural de la economía ante un choque de esa magnitud en los términos de intercambio, pero en la historia digamos, de la tasa de inflación ese choque relativamente pues, no es muy grande y especialmente importante la convergencia rápida a la meta de inflación del Banco de la República, es decir, hay una flexibilidad de la tasa de cambio y una credibilidad de la autoridad monetaria, esto es fundamental desde el punto de vista de la estabilidad. El otro frente es fiscal y aquí estoy mostrando de nuevo una historia de muy largo plazo. Esto muestra los eventos de crisis de deuda externa después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial en algunos países de América Latina. Eh, definido una crisis como un, digamos, un incumplimiento en el pago ya sea del capital o los intereses de estos países. Acá no tengo a todos, pero les puedo asegurar que Colombia es el único país de América Latina después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial que no ha tenido un problema de impago de su deuda externa. También es un tema extraordinario desde el punto de vista de la responsabilidad fiscal de nuestro país y ahora con otros instrumentos que ayudan digamos, adicionales como por ejemplo la regla fiscal. Y el tercer pilar es el pilar financiero, ese es un pilar un poquito más reciente de desarrollo. Colombia sufrió unas crisis bancarias financieras en los 80s, la gran crisis financiera de finales de los 90s, pero curiosamente, después de, las últimas dos, de los últimos dos choques que hemos sufrido, la gran crisis financiera internacional del 2009 y este reciente choque del 2014, la solidez del sector financiero ha sido tremendamente destacado. Acá muestro una historia muy reciente, por ejemplo, un indicador que ustedes muchos conocen, que es el indicador de solvencia y Colombia. And Colombia is uh, doing okay with respect uh, to the international arena. We have an adequate supervision, an independent and re responsible regulator, and the quality of the portfolio that even though it is deteriorating, it is at levels that, that uh, leave peace of mind with respect to the soundness of the sector. Nevertheless, uh, given that story of resilience of those three pillars, monetary, fiscal, and financial, which explain in an important way the huge stability of the Colombian economy throughout the 21st century and even before that and there are some important challenges ahead and I would like to uh, relate this to uh, productivity we have uh, done analysis on the productivity estimates uh, and sometimes economists explain productivity in a very confusing manner it indicates how efficient uh, production is given a level of investment installed machinery and employment in the companies in an aggregate manner. How efficient am I producing goods and services with the same amount of work and with the same amount of installed capital? That's productivity. And what we have found in a, in a recent story, I mean 25 years, is that productivity has not grown. This is what we have here total productivity of factors, how efficient is the productive sector, and actually during these 25 years, productivity has been of around 0.3%, almost zero, so it hasn't had an important impact when it comes to growth. And that's ratified in this graph uh, during the last uh, years, in the 21st uh, century, we see the sources of contribution to economic growth. We have three sources, investment, uh, which is seen in physical capital, the machines installed by ca companies to produce goods and services, then human capital, that is employment, uh, that whether it is more work hired or the quality of the employment reflected in a higher level of education. And the third one um, is uh, the residue, what uh, cannot uh, be explained through the quality of employment. In the 21st century, and that is until 2014, the growth of the Colombian economy was 4.1 in average. Uh, these three points come 
um, from the investment in uh, physical capital, 1.3 employment, that is more employment or a better employment quality, and PTF contributed negatively to economic growth. In other words, if it will not have been minus 0 0.2 but 0, the growth will have not been a 4.1 but a 4.3 during this period of 14 years. So traditional growth sources are being depleted because, as I show, these uh, investment is close to 28 percent. Uh, I mean, it could uh, reach uh, levels of 30 or 32 percent, but there's not that much room to grow when China had a growth rate of 40 percent. The old economies talk about rearranging the economic growth and to focus it on the growth of demand. That is an investment rate. So the unemployment rate was in two, no, two digits. No, no me cierres. So only we've had uh, the unemployment rate in one digit. We went, uh, we, we now have rates of 9%. Uh, so this could drop even more. Colombia has an employment rate above the average of Latin America, but there is no additional margin. It could be 7, 7.5%. Uh, that is the long-term rate. Now it's not going to be a 15 or 16%, uh, but it goes to 7%. Uh, so these uh, growth uh, sources are being depleted, mainly when it comes to employment because Colombia is going through a very uh, difficult situation with respect to the depletion of the demographic uh, bonus. Uh, now this, uh, lay, this force is being depleted and recent um, estimates indicate that by 2020 we're going to lose the demographic uh, bonus. That is how the economy adds in an important manner people in working age vis-a-vis -vis the, the proportion of children and uh, the elderly that are outside the labor market and it seems that that demographic bonus is being depleted. So when you uh, take a look at Latin America, you see that Colombia is not that different. Here you have Colombia, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Peru, Venezuela. Argentina is missing the blue bar, which is the contribution via physical capital. The yellow one, which is uh, through human capital. And the red one, which is PTF, is very similar. Only Peru in recent years has gone, something, uh, has gone through something interesting, its productivity growth. Uh, here I have Asia. And take a look at the difference with Asia. If, if you take the red bar to Asia, it looks like Latin America. The great difference is the growth in productivity, five points of growth, uh, which are giving rise to a very important dynamism at the level of Asian countries. So the question is, if Colombia has based its growth uh, in human capital, in physical capital, but these two sources apparently are depleting, we have to rearrange productivity, and that is a very important agenda. Sometimes we do not understand uh, uh, how productivity moves. So I want to propose an agenda of some elements which uh, are in the path of increasing productivity. I'm going to cover first territory productivity. I'm going to explain this um, shortly. Then uh, green growth, logistical infrastructure, quality of education, uh, spending efficiency, and quality of regulation. The agenda is not thinking only about increasing productivity of the private sector, but how the government does uh, things better. It is important to increase productivity of the public sector. Okay, territory productivity. The National Planning Department uh, four years ago uh, embarked on a very important um, mission, which was uh, the prospective uh, growth of Colombian cities. In 2014, we saw that 61% of the population was in urban centers um, in the city system. Colombia it is a country of cities with 47 cities with more than 100,000 inhabitants, and these are the ones that we identify as city systems. But uh, there is also a prospective vision um, how was going to be the involvement of the system by 2050. It was found that Colombia was going to add to cities 16 million new inhabitants. So it's not going to have uh, 
I mean, it's going to have uh, many cities with more than 100,000 inhabitants. I mean, 69 cities. And there you see, for example, on the northern side, Barranquilla, Cartagena, and Santa Marta. From the standpoint of economic functionality, it is going to be like uh, the system of one city. This is a, a very important prospectivity vision that should give rise to a planning in the territory. And what's tied into that, uh, it's an urban um, uh, growth rate. Uh, uh, we've been working with uh, NYU on this. This is an example. It's the case of Mocoa. Mocoa has had a disorganized uh, growth from the standpoint of the expansion of its urban and suburban area. This map shows how you are going to have more urban occupation, mainly in those two rivers. If you think about uh, the ordering of the territory, most likely you have to include uh, the adaptation of climate change. That didn't happen in Mocoa. See that uh, it, with time, um, a urban development development is around the rivers, and this is how it looks today. You have an important urban planning uh, next to the two rivers, uh, so that's why when the tragedy uh, struck, that's why we had the losses of many lives, and that's the result of a uh, disorganized uh, growth. So for some years now, exactly two years, we have been uh, supporting territorial entities in the formulations of their uh, zoning plans uh, with the acronym POT, because we find that 81% of these plans are outdated. The plans have um, a term of 12 years, so local uh, uh, governors must uh, update uh, those POTs, and that's something that has not happened yet. So we reached an agreement uh, with more than 100 uh, municipalities financing this with the best standards. We have international allies. NYU um, has helped us with urban area, the Remis Institute of Chile. And we're going to deliver the first product in the 11 municipalities of La Mojana, which is a very important area when it comes to climate change risk. And we're going to bring this first to POT. And the idea is to deliver it this year. But another component Component, which is the pro productivity of the territory, has to do with the zoning um, of rural productivity. That's one of the sectors that is going to drive economic growth in the future. Agriculture has been a sector that typically has grown below the mean of the rest of the sectors. Why? Because the, most of the crops have very low productivity. I'm, I'm showing you a table of different agricultural crops, which is the leading country in production, which is in the second column, the yield of the leading country, and which is the yield of Colombia. With respect to this information, Colombia has an advantage in sugar, where we have been very productive, uh, productivities of 91 tons per hectare. The leading country is 70.6. Uh, potato in China, it's 16.9. In Colombia, 20. But in the rest, uh, we still have important uh, gaps uh, in terms of productivity. So when you think about uh, the, the organization or the zoning of the territory, it is related not only to planning, but also to the proper use of uh, soil, the soil. How are we going to use this potential of agricultural exploitation in products that have productivity and that are competitive worldwide? This doesn't mean that we have to abandon these products. What this means uh, is that we have to go over the production process and, if necessary, to count on technical assistance. Here, this is an example for the case of rice. Here we have the yield for rice. When there is no credit or support uh, from the standpoint of technical assistance, the yield of a small producer, when he has no access to credit, to irrigation, etc., is of 2.18 per hectare. When people have access to credit, uh, that yield increases 2.72. Given the low level, it's an important uh, percentage increase. But if, in addition to credit, you can provide technical assistance, how to improve 
improve uh, the productive process that could um, reach 4.90, and if it has irrigation, it's 5.67 tons per hectare. So that is part of the agricultural public policy. How to have inclusion for small producer, uh, but also, I mean, to deliver technical assistance uh, because credit uh, is a sufficient condition, but it's not the only one to improve growth. The second component, green growth. This subject is one that we have led in the 2014 development plan, thinking about an agenda that has to do with Colombia's commitment of re reducing in 20% the greenhouse effects that was COP21 in Paris, and how can we create efficiencies in the productive process. So the first thing we did was to understand the sectoral components of greenhouse gases. The first one, the forestry sector use of soil. This accounts for 39% of emissions control and the agricultural sector that contributes with 20%. Colombia, in spite of everything, is a small country from the standpoint of greenhouse gases, less than 0.5% of the world total. So we are not relevant when it comes to our contribution to global warming. Nevertheless, we have, we have had a very important agenda uh, first, having this uh, green growth, uh, we have a mission of green growth with Fernando Jose Gomez, former director of DMP, to work with the private sector when it comes to productive efficiency. The topic of green growth is not only an environmental topic, it deals also with efficiencies. As for example, how can you have a better use of waste in the production process that helps the environment, but it also reduces cost, uh, and that's the vision uh, from that standpoint point of green growth, uh, the use of waste. Um, we have a rate of 70% is very low when compared to our peers and to international levels. In other words, Colombia is wasting resources that could give rise to productive and environmental efficiencies. And uh, the tax reform, two things were included, the tax um, on plastic bags uh, and also the green tax. The third topic is a, a more traditional one. And we have always talked about infrastructure. I want to show a very simple graph, not, not to talk about uh, causality. Here we have the GDP of countries, and we have the quality of infrastructure on the vertical axis measured uh, by world uh, development indicators. What this shows is that the richest countries are those with better infrastructure uh, quality. Uh, I mean, it's just very difficult to find a product with low infrastructure levels and to have a high GDP per income. Colombia is around here, given our development level. We have a gap with respect to the quality of infrastructure of our country. And uh, this uh, is due to the quality of our roads, our railroads. And one of the programs of this government has been that uh, of roads and highways, road infrastructure, the 4G that uh, at uh, 2018, we we're talking of 19 billion pesos. So it's the fourth largest program in the world, and this is going to give rise to efficiencies from the standpoint of production cost, time saved, which is going to result in important dividends in the long term. So not only uh, double lane infrastructure, the tertiary uh, system is very important and it connects agricultural production centers with large cities and uh, with our export ports because we do very little having two lane highways or roads if the peasants when they start uh, their production uh, they cannot uh, take uh, they cannot uh, take uh, their products from there And uh, you have seen, whenever you travel, the changes uh, that you can see in airports in large cities and also mid-sized cities, some of the railroad infrastructure. We do have a high debt here to develop uh, in a more important way a railroad infrastructure and also to support the responsibility of the departments, which is the secondary network. Another component, uh, well, 
Colombia is around here, very similar to the previous one. When one looks at income, uh, a, income per capita and uh, and also logistic and economic development, you see that the richest countries are those that have a higher infrastructure quality. Colombia has important gaps from the standpoint of logistics. As for example, we found two years ago that companies in Colombia pay 15% of their total sales in logistic cost. In Latin America, that figure is 11%. In the U.S., that cost is of around 7 or 8%, which means that we are above uh, the mean of Latin America and of the mean of developed countries. Important component is transportation and storage. That's natural. I mean, that's costly from the logistics standpoint. And we have considered uh, developing a logistic mission, which is work in progress, in order to close the bottlenecks of the logistic process, in order for you to understand the importance of this topic, which is not that uh, sexy from the standpoint point of public policy. Just think in a 4G highway that saves eight hours if you go from Bogotá to Barranquilla or Bogotá to or Bogotá Buenaventura. Customs times in Colombia for the clearance of of us, goods, it takes from five to six days. In the countries of the Pacific Alliance, that takes three days. So to save eight hours in a double lane road, but to, to waste two or three days in a customs process, it's not going to produce that impact we're aiming at. And we're also looking at the multimodal component to c carry out some exercises, as for example, what happens if you use uh, our cargo trajectory, which is not only by um, land, I mean, take Bogotá Barranquilla was 1,000 kilometers and it counts $2,600 to move a container. But if you can do the first 800 kilometers by the river and then the last 180 kilometers by land, then the cost could drop in one third, uh, that is $830. So it doesn't apply for all sorts of cargo, but it is a significant savings of two thirds when it comes to transportation cost. This uh, multimodal vision is of paramount importance, and that's why we've been striving to develop the different modes or means of transportation. Also, uh, the quality of education. Uh, well, this uh, has to do uh, well with increasing productivity, but everything has to do with early childhood, uh, basic, intermediate education. And now I would like to focus on higher education. Here we have a very important uh, issue. This was a finding of Eduardo Lora, an economist that worked a long time for IDB. And uh, he found that uh, between supply and demand, supply in red and demand blue, there is a gap when it comes to technical and technological training. So companies uh, require more technicians and technologists uh, with certain specific characteristics uh, that are not being produced today in the higher education system. That can be seen to the left. Uh, that's enrollments uh, in university. That's the blue line growing steadily. And the technical and technological one, which is the red line, that shows uh, some stagnation. Some students do not know that there is an important gap and there is a high I demand at the technical and te technological level in the, the, com the companies of our country. Okay, we need to have uh, uh, data. Uh, uh, students do not know that companies require technicians and technologists, uh, that they could be well paid. It's important for them to be informed about it. And uh, secondly, we have uh, the uh, um, the national framework uh, on uh, skills, um, and uh, that's two pillars. One is the university pillar. The other one is a technical or technological pillar. Sometimes they, they do not want to study a technical career because they think they're going to be stuck there in Germany. They cannot do the transition between um, the technical, technological, and university education, and that requires a national framework on skills. And I would like uh, to close this education-related topic with something very important coverage. 
This is necessary in 2010. Higher education accounted for 37.1% of uh, those eligible, those that are going to study. I mean, uh, high school graduates. Uh, that is in six years. We increased that. Uh, we closed that in 51.6%. Uh, but this should be at levels of 80 and 90%, as is the case in countries such as Chile. So we still have uh, an important gap when it comes to higher education. I would like to highlight this topic. The increase of coverage is related to a more equitable access to higher education, which is part, it has been achieved through a program you're familiar with. The name in Spanish is Serpilo Paga. This graph has a six economic levels. Uh, the, re the red one in 2010, uh, second half, uh, which is the likelihood of a person of uh, income level one to have access to higher education. So basically what the red line indicates, that one out of three students of uh, economic level one can have access to higher education. And in, that high, in, the in income level six is two out of three. So ser pilo paga has given rise to an important uh, achievement in access. For example, you can take this case for uh, for those with the highest uh, scores in Saber, it increased from 34 to 64%. Uh, regarding uh, the likelihood to, to have access uh, to higher education. So it's like you have a, a level play um, field there. Obviously, we have to offer more coverage, but it had uh, an amazing impact. At last, uh, I'm going to talk about the productivity of the public sector because uh, this productivity-related topic is not only to create uh, enabling conditions for the sector to do things better, but we as public sector, how can we do things better? The first thing is the efficiency in public spending. Uh, this is a quick analysis that we conducted a year ago on how to concentrate on the transfers and subsidies made uh, by the state to households in our country. These transfers and subsidies are around nine uh, points of GDP. Here we have pension health, uh, public utilities, housing, in um, early childhood programs, etc. The important thing about this table is how do we focus on that? Here we have uh, the quintiles of income, 20% poorest, and the other level until you have uh, the, the richest or the wealthiest um, segment. What this graph shows is that uh, there are transfers to households that are, are not well focused. You are familiar with pensions. Um, th these two add up to 70 25%. Uh, that means that to, nowadays pensions uh, go to the 40% uh, wealthiest group of the country. Uh, I mean, it's usually received by formal employees. Uh, public utilities uh, poorly concentrated. It's done through income levels, and it has uh, lost its usefulness as a tool. And housing, because a uh, countercyclic state policy that has given r rise to subsidies uh, to certain levels of housing. But to summarize, we see that 20% uh, uh, that is the, that this spending, the transfer of subsidy is going. I mean, it's not progressive. One might think that if it has a social concept, it should be very progressive. And this has an impact on inequality in a marginal manner if it's not well focused. Um, then uh, it, it will not really have an impact on inequality. This um, uh, shows Gini, the inequality index. The higher the index, the higher inequality before and after monetary subsidy. We were not able to identify uh, in-kind subsidies. Since they are not well focused, then the subsidies do not have an important impact on inequality. Compare this to Germany and UK. Uh, Germany and UK has uh, inequality levels before the transfer, before the transfer, very similar to those of Colombia. Once the state uh, it transfers subsidies and taxes to households, the Gini indicator goes. Uh, uh, to uh, 0 0.33, so um, you can improve uh, uh, equality here, and that's going to have an impact on productivity. 
And at last, I would like to wrap up with the quality of regulation. This uh, subject has not been that studied uh, from the standpoint of public policy, but we think it is of utmost importance in order to have clear rules of the game and, and, and for these rules to lead to, um, to stable. As is the case of the insurance sector, which is highly regulated, we conducted a very interesting analysis in order to understand uh, the rules uh, at uh, the state level, uh, at the level of the executive branch. We, we uh, covered uh, these years here, and these are the figures in the official journal, whether decrees, technical regulations, official letters. I mean, they have to be published in the official um, journal. And this is like a sweep of what we found during the 17 years. We have that 95,000 rules have been issued by the executive branch, almost 69,000 resolutions, 17,000 decrees. And here I have the daily figures. So it's like 2.8 decrees per day. Let's recall the decrees are the ones that have the, uh, the signing of the President of the Republic, 11 resolutions, and more than 15 standards that are issued by the executive branch. This doesn't include bills or what's issued at the territorial level. So this has to do with a problem of regulatory inflation. It is very difficult to think that if we are issuing almost three decrees per day, we know that the economic quality of that regulation I mean, perhaps it's not what the citizen expects. If you take a look at this at the OECD level, and I would like to highlight that we have learned through this process to access OECD, I mean, how to work on regulation. Regulation accounts for almost four four points of GDP. Obviously, regulation is necessary. The important thing is for the regulation to be issued will be such that the economic, social, environmental benefit will be above the cost imposed to the private sector. There are some interesting things in the U.S. Uh, there is a regulation issued by President Trump. Uh, it's uh, one in, two out. Uh, so if uh, if, a regula if a sector wants to issue regulation, they have to delete uh, to, I mean, uh, U.S. Um, has advanced a lot uh, in that area, and also in U.K. So a uh, progress in regulation. Um, we have a decree that was issued in 2012 where 1,300 uh, processes uh, or proceedings were eliminated. Also, when it comes to public consultation, I spend half of my time uh, getting visits from the private sector complaining about the little opportunity of, uh, of uh, debating the regulation. Some ministries were issuing a regulation, for example, Friday afternoon, and uh, the signing takes place on Monday, so there is no time for citizens' participation. Well, as of March this year, all the decrees signed by the President of the Republic require 15 days of public consultation. That's a must in order to guarantee a proper regulation. And this is very important. We are putting in place, and we are learning with OECD, the uh, regulatory standard OECD. It's very straightforward, but it's the economic quality of the regulation. It's an analysis uh, on the potential impact uh, of the regulation and to understand if that impact uh, is higher than the cost imposed to the private sector. We have been working on some pilot projects with some superintendencies in order to give rise to the mand mandatory nature of that. Uh, we've been uh, working on this for the past three years, and we think it's going to be very important to increase productivity. So I want to close. Uh, this is like the summary, Colombia. Its uh, history has been amazing uh, from the standpoint of resilience. Colombia has had three pillars, fiscal, monetary, and financial, that explains that resilience, the end of the conflict. It's a topic that I have not mentioned, but I think that it gives rise to important growth opportunities, mainly in two sectors, agriculture, uh, because, uh, I mean, and also tourism, I mean, it's to put an end to that uh, quote-unquote franchise uh, uh, that uh, this creates import or produces important benefits in terms of tourism, but this requires work when it comes to territory productivity, clear rules of the game, and obviously zoning and the proper use of the soil. 
The country today counts on a strategic geographic location in order to be part of a global value chains um, in order to increase productivity, production diversity. But today, and that's the agenda we're working on, we consider that traditional growth sources have been depleted, and we want to put in place not a government agenda, but a state agenda that will enable for these initiatives to continue and will lead us to a path of productivity. What are we expecting with this? For for Colombia, by 2030, to be the more competitive economy of the region, it could take a big leap from a country of mid-income to a high income. And uh, at the government and you at the private sector, can work. we can work together in order to drive the economy towards a growth based on productivity. Thank you very much.